Okay, perfect. I guess we covered enough theory about GANs that now we are able to focus on applications most of the time. So let's try to do that. From this point on, it's gonna be mostly applications. So let's start with high resolution image synthesis and semantic manipulation. And then we are gonna go back to conditional GANs. What do we want to do? There is a semantic label that we want to map it into generated images. So this is a one-to-many mapping scenario. The competing method is giving you these blurry images. They look good, but you can actually improve, improve upon them because these are low resolution. We want to make them high resolution. And these are the results of this paper, more crisp. What are some of the applications? You can change the label types. For instance, here you can see some trees. And if your application is self-driving car, uh, as I mentioned, the self-driving car is gonna lead, need a lot of data. So it's gonna be good to be able to generate new data and new scenes, new images, using the same data that you already had, you can actually go ahead and remove the trees and replace them with buildings. So you're just changing the label of this uh, tree to be a building, and then it's gonna replace it with buildings. So this is one of the applications. Or we can change the road type, but how are we gonna do it? The problem is making these types of networks high resolution and be able to generate high resolution images. Previously, we had this image to image framework we're going to use with we're going to use the same framework but now you want to make things high resolution you have a generator you have a discriminator the generator is translating semantic label maps so these guys to to images to realistic looking images and the discriminator is distinguishing between real and fake between real and translated ones your data are in the form of pairs of semantic labels like this, and images. So that's a semantic label map. This is the corresponding natural photo. And that's our GAN objective function. And because it is conditional, you're conditioning your discriminator on S and uh, your generator is conditioned on S as well. In terms of your neural network, you're gonna use a new UNET architecture with some, uh, it's a neural network encoder decoder with some residual connections. And then your discriminator is gonna look at patches of your image. So it's gonna focus on this patch, discriminate between real and fake, it's gonna focus on the other patch, discriminate between real and fake, et cetera. And then the final probabilities is just the average of these probabilities over the patches. That's your discriminator. But then using that framework, you're gonna go up until 256 by 256. As soon as you increase the resolution beyond that, it's gonna fail. And these are one of the images generated using this framework. So you want to improve upon that and you want to make them high resolution, 2048 by 1024. What are the tricks that you're gonna need? You're gonna change the neural network architecture. You're gonna design a neural network that is easier to train. Let's see, you can have your G1. This is the generator that you're gonna start with and it's gonna work with images that are 256 by 256. It's gonna take a semantic label map and it's gonna map it to a low resolution image. You can train that. Using a discriminator, you can train that. And the same framework as, as above, you can train that. Now you're gonna take a high resolution input and you want to output a high resolution output. This is G1, that is G2. You take the high resolution input and then you encode it a little bit using a bunch of convolutions until this box here and this tensor here have the same size. Now you can add them. And that's gonna be the input to the other residual blocks. That's doing the deconvolution, the transpose convolution. And this is just a two times down sampling. Now you're gonna use another set of discriminators to distinguish between real and fake images in the space of high resolution images. Now you're gonna train these new parameters in addition to fine tuning these smaller parameters, the parameters of the smaller network, G1, okay? You change your architecture to give you the course to find generator. You're gonna change your loss function. Rather than having a single discriminator, you're gonna have multiple discriminators. I'm gonna tell you the exact loss. And then you're gonna change your adversarial loss slightly. So what are we gonna do? 
you're going to have three discriminators, D1, D2, D3. And each one is looking at different resolutions. Basically, if you have a real image and then you have a corresponding generated image, you can downsample both of them and give that to D1. You can increase the resolution slightly, give it to D2. Increase the resolution to the full scale and give it to D3. Now you have three discriminators helping you write down your loss function for the generator. So that part is there. You have multi-scale discriminator. And then we learned about the feature matching before. Rather than looking at the final output of your discriminators, you can look at the feature maps at some intermediate layer and put L2 loss there. So the techniques that we learned previously are actually helping us here. And then this is actually the feature match, feature matching loss function. So you cut your neural network, your discriminator at some layer and use the layer, the pixels at that layer. You compute the L1 norm rather than L2 norm because L1 norm is less sensitive to outliers. And then you can uh, use that feature matching loss function. And this is exactly what I explained. You look at discriminator, the second discriminator, for instance, and I don't know, the 10th layer features. So you are cutting your network. And T is the total number of layers up until that point of your discriminator. And N I is the number of elements in each layer. So it's going to be the number of pixels. And there is also another trick. Not only you need to input the semantic labels, as you can see, some of these cars, they are occluding each other. So you're going to go from blue to blue. And it's going to make the job of your generator a little bit difficult. So it's going to be really helpful if you can give it the boundaries of these objects. Otherwise, this is going to be the same color. Now you're going to have some boundaries. So these are one hot vectors. So it's going to be one here and zeros everywhere else. And then you're just concatenating this boundary map with a semantic map. And that's going to be the input to your generator and the discriminator. This is without boundary map. Things are blurry at the boundary. But as you include the boundary map, things are going to become sharp. As you can see, this is sharp here. And these are generated images, by the way. They look really good. And in terms of numbers, you can look at two metrics. So I don't want to go into that. There is the pixel accuracy and then mean intersection over union. These ones we cover in part one of the course when we do semantic segmentation. And the moral of the story is that these are doing really good. Okay, And they're actually close to having the original images. Any questions? Uh, yeah, a, a cool one. If we're in G2, the generator in 2 we're giving the high resolution image. Uh, what are we doing in testing if we only have the small image? No, in testing, this is exactly what you're going to do. You have a generator that's going to take as input a high resolution semantic map, and it's going to output a high resolution image. Whatever that I'm writing here, everything else is just for you to train this model. Once this model is trained, then the rest of it is just sampling from it. And you can do these applications. For instance, you can recolor the trees to be buildings, and then it's going to give you buildings. Any other questions? Uh, for conditional GANs, it seems like people typically don't add the noise vector. Is it just empirically not helpful to do so? As soon as you have an input, that's a great question. As soon as you have an input, the dropout is going to act as the noise. Okay. So you don't need to add extra noise to your model. The dropout layers are going to act as the noise for you. Does that answer your question? Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah.